Sir Cower. Have you? I, as a matter of fact, I'm from the continent. I, yeah, are you a Dutchman? I'm a Dutchman, uh-huh. and I'm reformed, and uh-huh. a whole lot of other things. <laughs> you're not Dutch, you're not much. <laughs> it's a great country. That's the, the Holland and Scotland, the two little countries, are probably the most Calvinistic countries in the world. But go ahead, don't let me interrupt well, you. Well, some people say they were, and they aren't anymore. And I'm not so sure. Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I won't comment on that one. <laughs> I'm, I'm Norm's pastor, and I sometimes, he sometimes thinks that I put the hole in the dice. Oh, I see, I see. Well, when you, for instance, when you, for instance, say about this matter of the um, slippery slope, uh, Karl Barth was... Can you all hear? Can you all hear? Mm-hmm. Karl Barth was an, uh, an outright liberal, as you said, and he became uh, what you may call neo-orthodox or whatever. But you know what I've also seen? That, that he went all the way down on that toboggan, so to speak, that he dipped out on the other end. I've seen a whole lot of liberal churches that finally began to see something about the Word of God, mm-hmm. went beyond uh, Karl Barth, and mm-hmm. are today far more orthodox than the mm-hmm. church has been in ages. Mm-hmm. And I think that should be said, too. Yeah, I, I agree see, with all that, you understand. see a whole lot of people struggling with this whole thing, you know, what? ought to be our definition, and I find that a hard word, definition, our description of the Bible. To me, it is, it, it, it is trustworthy, it is reliable, it is God's word by which he reveals himself and all the rest. I have a hard time working with a thing in error. I think what we, what we are doing quite often, we become too rationalistic, and that rationalism can become a god you know, that we become too excessive. Aren't we using, trying to use a, a, a secular tool and then impose that on the scripture and say, this is it, rather than it become the other way around? And I think this is what Lassur is probably doing. He is an exegete before he is a dogmatician. One of the things that I learned in this country is first you have to know your dogmatics and then really, they didn't teach it that way, but that's what it came down to. And then you become an exegete. Until I came into Compton in the Netherlands and they said, exegese, exegese, exegese. Exegese, that's a German word for you know, exegesis. And, and, and then you begin to realize how you have to yeah, put the truth of God together in a, a, a rational way, or you may call it dogma mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yes, the, um, the, um, we have a kind of difference in this country that you have uh, in Europe. That is, some schools here, uh, Pastor, are uh, more exegetically oriented than others. Some are more systematically uh, oriented. But um, those who defend the doctrine of inerrancy um, are both exegetes and uh, systematicians. I just happened to mention that at the Wenham Conference, the exegetes were the ones more sensitive to harmonistic problems than the uh, theologians, because the theologians are not working in that area as much as the exegetes. And as I say, I personally, I, um, I guess you were here for that part, when I mentioned about Dr. Lesore, uh proving to me that he was an inerrantist himself and just begging him to say, before he went into another uh, uh, statement of problems that had to be faced, that I believe in inerrancy, see, as he told me under scrutiny and so on. And I'd like other exegetes to say the same thing, because the doctrine itself rests on exegesis. The classical passage is, of course, 2 Timothy 3.16 and 2 Peter 1 and uh, John 10.35 and so on. These are exegetical passages. And the only thing I would uh, comment on uh, beyond what you have said, if I may take off, or what you said basically, let me just go back to Bart just a moment about that figure you used about going down a slope and coming up uh, up again. Uh, it would take me the rest of my time to comment on uh, on that, and um, maybe I better not even say anything at all if I, uh, I can't. I would really have to comment on that. I know what you mean. I agree with it in a certain sense, and I don't agree with it in another sense, but it's a figure of speech, so really, what do I know? I'll just let that one, uh, let that one rest, but I will... Uh, well, I'd say this one thing about uh, Bart. It's not necessarily connected with that particular figure. 
The way I put it about Karl Barth is that, um, you know, Burkhauer wrote a book, The Triumph of Grace in the Theology of Karl Barth. I think Burkhauer, your mentor, whom I have a great deal of regard also as a competent historian of dogma, but not sound on this particular doctrine or on the Barthian interpretation, in my opinion. I'm with Van Til in the, the battle between the two of them. I'm not a presuppositionalist, but in the struggle between those two giants in the field of uh, reform theology, I think uh, Van Til's uh, critique is, uh, is sounder, as I'm sure you must feel Burkhauer's uh, uh, critique of Van Til is sounder, and, uh, and so on. But anyway, Burkhauer wrote a book uh, entitled, uh, I may say to the rest of you here, uh, The Triumph of Grace and the Theology of Karl Barth. And I think it, uh, I don't think he established his case. But what I do say, and this is where I think you would agree and feel, and so would Dr. Burkhauer agree, as far as I could ascertain, grace triumphed in the heart of Karl Barth. I think that it never did succeed in triumphing in his theology because he never really triumphed over the uh, liberalism with which he was struggling. He was anti-liberal, no question about that. He tried to overcome it, no question about that. But he did it by doing what I think Pannenberg accuses him of doing, of uh, putting his ship in the harbor of uh, safety and so on by this paradoxical method by which criticism couldn't touch it and so on. And that's in a certain sense what I would say correspond to your figure at the top of the slope. He's in the harbor. He has arrived. Um, I don't think theologically he has articulated it as soundly as Dr. Burkhauer thinks he has, but I do believe from listening to Dr. Bart and knowing his son uh, rather well, who was more Bartian than he was, uh, really, uh, that um, he, did, uh, he did have grace. He did have grace uh, in, his, uh, in his heart. I can even understand why the problem would exist. I mean, knowing uh, it reminds me of something C.S. Lewis talks about. You evaluate something from that from which it was made. And you can, when you look at the life of Karl Barth, you realize how thoroughly, uh, kind of regats, uh, regats man he was, you know, at the beginning. A thoroughgoing, uh, uh, socialist with no vestigial remains of any kind of evangelical religion. When that first, uh, Rember brief came out and then the second edition of it and so on, he rang the bell that woke up all, all Europe and so on. That, uh, that he was uh, trying to say something. He was trying to move all the way over there. I don't think he succeeded it, but, uh, in it, but, they, but his effort to do that was an admirable thing. And as you say, it has been the occasion for, for uh, many people doing that. And I was just commenting, I understand, this morning or this afternoon earlier on his view of the Bible. I don't know whether you agree with that or not, but I am saying this. But what he meant by verbal inspiration, I may develop this uh, point that you didn't comment on this, but I want to explain a little bit more in the light of our little... Um, a little dialogue on uh, Bart, uh, what I meant uh, uh, by his uh, view of uh, Scripture as verbal inspiration and not verbal inspired height. Uh, that uh, explained what that, uh, what that uh, meant. But uh, the reason Bart uh, maintained that doctrine of total non-inspiration, really, uh, we talk about uh, plenary inspiration, totally, total non-inspiration, was the fact that it's a total human work. Paul was a man and John was a man and Peter was a man and Mark was a man. It was a total human work. And it had the, uh, had the aspects of humanity on it all the way and Bart apparently operates on that uh, famous idiom, it's human to err. And consequently, err could happen to it. And his basic criti criticism of either of these views, but particularly of this view, is that it denies the reality of human authorship. It stresses the divine inspiration, the divine inbreathing so much that it denies, it ought affirms that Paul wrote it and so on, but it denies real human authorship because if it recognized human authorship, it would recognize error there and so on. And they accuse us, you surely recognize this, of docetism, the heresy of docetism. That is, that the humanity of Christ and the humanity of people is not a real but a seeming thing, and that uh, the re real humanity of uh, the writers of the Bible only was an appearance and not a reality. Now, that's the, that's the rationale behind his radical position. He feels he's doing real justice to this, and that the inerrancy view is doing, doing real violence to this because they're guilty of this heresy. My criticism of that is, no, we don't deny that this is a human work, but we simply say 
that God is able to preserve a human being from error. And I don't know that Karl Barth or anybody else would ever deny the proposition that God is quite able. It's just a question of whether there's any evidence that he has done so. And we believe there is evidence that he has done so. So we say we are not docetists. We don't deny the reality of these. We deny their error. And we say to Karl Barth, could you deny that if God did choose to infallibly communicate his word through them, that God could do so? And Karl Barth would be the last one in the world to deny that, I think. I'll give you the last word on this uh, subject. Well, I, I think what we ought to do besides what you have been doing is also see where Karl Barth has been of any assistance to us in understanding what the Word of God is. Karl Barth will also be the first one that is going to say that the Word of God is God-breathed, and he will quote that same passage. But not the Scriptures. Up. But and not the, the Scriptures. Wait a minute. But then he is going to emphasize the existential vitality of that Word. But not the words. Not the whereby. Not the whereby. Not the whereby. Not the whereby. The where boom. Not the whereby. If we want to know what God is saying and what he is all about and how he is revealing himself, I think then it is good to read the heretics in order to discover the truth. I read far more heretics than Orthodox, so I must be in good shape. I mean, if you, do, if you read contemporary literature, you're going to be reading far more heresy than orthodoxy there. And I think uh, any seminary professor is obliged uh, to do that. Bob? Uh, the remember, it says systematician has that, too. I mean, the <laughs> systematician recognizes any problem. And let me say this before I get your question, Bob. When I talk about harmonization, it's the primary work of an exegete to deal in that particular area. But a systematician will not be able to believe that the Bible is the word of God if the exegete can show their errors in it, and so on. Okay, go ahead. I guess my statement, the question is, we have to be so careful how we define inerrancy. Um, my particular case in point is uh, Matthew 13, for example. Uh, any light you could throw into this, I don't mean necessarily in reconciling, but uh, as how the typical inerrantist holds this, uh, where Christ is speaking of the kingdom Oh, you're not going to do that. Daniel Fuller, ready we will, sir? Oh, my, Robert, I didn't think you would do a thing like that to me. Yeah. Huh? Oh, Robert. Robert. And it's ten minutes to four already, too. I mean, yeah. But since you've raised it, I guess I have to wrestle with it. I'm the one who opened this up to discussions and questions and so on. <laughs> I think you all get Dr. Uh, Lawson's point here that comes from Dr. Sa uh, Dr. Uh, Dan Fuller, the son of uh, Charles Fuller, who led in the organization of uh, Fuller Seminary, and the son, Dan, who's a teacher there, is also dean, I think, still. He was dean for a while anyway uh, there, and he, uh, he uh, uh, uses this. He maintains that he believes in inerrancy, and uh, according to the intention, and he uses an example of what he thinks is an error as far as fact is concerned, and uh, nevertheless, not an error as far as intention is concerned. And thus he cites this mustard seed as the smallest of the seeds of the earth, smallest of the seeds in Matthew 13 that uh, Bob Louth has just referred to and points out that as a matter of simple fact, it is not the smallest of seeds. There are smaller seeds than that. And that uh, technically that's an error. And technically uh, inerrancy is wrong. And... Um, uh, Dr. Fuller goes on to say that uh, I don't think it's wrong because uh, I don't think it proves to, uh, errancy because what it ought to mean, what the term inerrancy ought to mean is without any error as far as what is intended is concerned. And what is intended in this, uh, at this particular case by our Lord is not to comment on the relative size of seeds, but as a matter of fact to deal with the fact that the kingdom began. It's a very small thing and became a very, a very large thing, a very tiny thing to a very large thing. So that while it's an error in fact, it is not an error in intention. No error in intention. Now, this is uh, what Bob Lawson is asking me to uh, comment uh, on. And um, the, uh, the way I said it may not be quite uh, the way uh, Dan Fuller uh, puts it, but um, it's essentially that way. But I may have stated it in a way... It's a little bit more in line with my own thinking, but the way I have stated it, I wouldn't object to it. 
uh, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with this idea of intentionalism because it's, uh, it's uh, opening a Pandora's box where it can be applied elsewhere. But um, I think it is true, and I guess you know probably, Bob, that uh, Pinnock had, had a literary debate with, uh, with Fuller on this very exegesis and the evangelical quarterly and all. Pinnock, as I say, is an inerrantist who's... Uh, He's on a slippery slope as far as an errancy is concerned, I think, but he's still at the top of the slide. I'm afraid he's uh, heading downward away from uh, uh, inerrancy himself in his own eagerness to, uh, to broach uh, the differences uh, between it. But he points out that uh, this type of uh, phrase is uh, just a usus loquendi of the day. It's the way you express things. Uh, 80 million Frenchmen can't be wrong. You know, it's that kind of a statement, and uh, it, it's not meant to be a serious uh, uh, botanical uh, observation, which Christ's reputation is on the line, or something like that, and I think that is uh, that's perfectly true. But the trouble is, once you once you say that, uh, somebody's going to rush in with a principle of uh, inerrant only as far as intention, and he's always going to be looking for some uh, hidden intention and so on that makes something um, incorrect but still correct because of that hidden intention. Though I will say, Bob, to, ke- to keep the matter uh, brief, unless you want to pursue it further that uh, I would say that this type of thing uh, is, is a legitimate construction of uh, Dan Fuller's. Uh, as he was at that uh, Jit Wenham conference, for example, and I, uh, I sat with him at lunch one time uh, there, and we carried on quite a lengthy uh, Montgomery was across the way, and uh, somebody else, uh, uh, what's his name, Lewis Johnson, and uh, Dan Fuller. And we were talking about this matter. I think that uh, what he was meaning to say was a sound thing, and that there shouldn't really be any basic difference between him and Clark Pinnock on this uh, on this uh, point, but intentionalism. I, I simply say this: I don't think that you can uh, make a, a system that really invalidates inerrancy on the ground of a hidden intention. What I would try to say is, without getting into a major discussion on the matter, is it has to be very clear that in a given case where something is indisputably inaccurate, as this particular statement is inaccurate, technically speaking, that obviously. I mean, everybody, common sense, looking at this thing, seeing the context and what Jesus is saying, would say he is not trying to register a botanical fact for the Encyclopedia Botanica or something like a biological fact, or botanical fact for it or something like that, and just trying to illustrate something. With that, with that particular limitation, I think it's an acceptable hermeneutical uh, principle. But uh, there's more to it than meets the eye in the, in the other area. Now, um, let me get into this particular point. Unless there any other questions from the last time? Let me get into this uh, point that I'm referring to with respect to uh, David uh, Friedman and an aspect of the apologetics of this uh, situation uh, here for uh, inerrancy and infallibility. The, um, the um, word inerrancy, of course, doesn't occur in the Bible, and um, some approximations to it do, but the fundamental case is what Burkow and others would call deductive and so on, and a good many people in the body and movement as well, have um, looked askance at deduction. I remember, for example, one time I was walking across the breezeway at Pittsburgh with Marcus Bart, and uh, he says to me, uh, uh, Jack, what's so important about system? What's so important about system and deduction and such things as that? And I said, Marcus, look, the Bible says thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Now, it doesn't use your name or my name in it, but that clearly says, Thou, Marcus Bart, shalt not kill. Thou, Jack Gerstner, shalt not kill. Now, that's a deduction. That's an inevitable deduction. Every time you preach, Tom, if you've expounded a passage, you show its meaning to the uh, congregation, just as I will be doing this evening here, that's what preaching is all about. You find out what the text says and how it actually applies, and you can't help but drawing those uh, deductions. Otherwise, the Bible wouldn't be teaching anything. If this were just a detached proposition made years and years ago and so on with no particular reference to any particular individual. Of course, it would have no application, but it applies, as you know, to everybody in this room. But it's by way of deduction. And I say to Marcus, I say the breeze waves a small way, so it had to go very, very quickly as we made this little comment. But that's the, that, that was utterly characteristic of the whole movement uh, about, uh, about this matter of deduction as over against induction and favoring exegesis, as it were, as over against systematic theology and making a kind of... Uh, of a duality there that doesn't belong. Systematic theology belongs on the basis of exegesis. And once you do, from exegesis, develop systematic ideas, of course, they influence your exegesis. Also, in the future, it can't help being that way. But the classic passage there, uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, uh, 
me, uh, draws uh, the inevitable conclusion that if God is the inspirer of it, it has to be. If it's all scripture and it's inspired by God, it has to be uh, indeed inerrant. Uh, Jim Boyce and I were at Princeton Seminary a little less than a year ago with uh, some students there, and we were advocating this uh, type of thing. And uh, at one particular point, I wrote on the blackboard uh, something that a great many people are prepared to say, and most of the people in the audience that day would have been prepared to say, the Bible is the word of God which errs. I said, uh, you keep, a, you keep a, a sentence like that and can repeat a sentence like that and don't quite see the horror of a sentence like that immediately. And I wrote it uh, back there and I said, now let's, let's erase the word Bible here because that's just the definition of the word of God. We're getting a little closer to the point of peril and it's becoming more obvious and the students were very sensitive to this point and they, see, they could see where I was going and they were beginning to protest already even when I was just wipe, uh, wiping the word uh, Bible off uh, there, and we, uh, we took the problems as they came along, and so on. But all right, so uh, uh, now we have remaining this particular proposition, the Word of God. Now, we can eliminate the Word, because um, it's, after all, the Word of God. It's the Word of God. It's the same thing as God saying. And now we're up against the ultimate statement. And boy, the place was in pandemonium by that time, because it's about nobody is prepared to say, God errs. Uh, for some strange reason, when you put it in a slightly longer form, the Bible is word of God, which errs. You can somehow say that. Even that makes people uncomfortable. You don't want to say inerrancy, no errancy. And you don't want to give up the idea that the Bible is the word of God in some sense. See, the liberals, they, they, the liberals can do that. See, they, they, it's not the word. Of course it can err. Because they, but they would never say it's the word of God. But the people who don't want to give up the idea, as biblical authority people, don't want to give up the proposition that the Bible is the word of God, all we're asking them to do uh, is recognize what they're saying if they're doing this. They're going to try to avoid deduction and so on. All right, this is what your proposition is then. The Bible is the word of God which errs. You can manage to say that. It's harder to say this. It's impossible to say that. I don't know any person who believes in God who thinks for one moment that God can err. And they, they try to say, well, we don't think God can err. It's man who errs and so on. All right, then you don't believe it's the word of God. It's the word of man. Oh, it's the word of God through man. Well, if it's the word of God through man, then it's still the word of God through man, and it's the word of God who errs. You can drop out the through man because it's the word of God to come through. Far as I say, he makes it the word of God coming through man, but the word of God that actually comes into the pages of Scripture is the word of man. And because it's the word of man, it has to be uh, error, and he can say it's error, and there's no problem with that because man can err, and man does err according to him. But if it's the word of God, and it's God who errs. I can't find anybody who says that. But if you can see a fallacy in that particular statement of uh, the actual situations before it, point it out. I haven't been able to see anything. I don't see how anybody can avoid it who is going to say that the Bible is the word of God uh, uh, and not affirm that it's inerrant. If it's inerrant, then of course it's followed. But if it is errant, if there's any one iota of error in it, then you're having to say what I'm afraid has to be blasphemy. If you can avoid it, well and good. If you don't want to avoid it, if you don't want to say blasphemy, I, I don't know what conclusion you have. You're either going to have to give up the Bible as the word of God or you're going to have to give up the proposition of error in it, it seems to me. It's called, you could call it rational or something like that, but we can't help but be rational. We are rational human beings. And we just simply have no vehicle for which we could, uh, by which we can apprehend revelation or anything else except by these reasons of ours. And the thing we have to be careful about is that we use those reasons uh, carefully. We were talking about yesterday morning up here about the Jesus' question. Whom do you men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Well, you know the data. You know what I've said. You know what I've done. You've seen me. Now, draw a conclusion. What do you think? Who do you say? What's your idea? And so on. There's no other way by which, even revelation. And this uh, little work of mine on Edwards and the Doctrine of Bible, we point out the fact that he develops this quite strongly. Revelation has to be through reason. Not from reason. That's what rationalism is. The difference between rationalism and Christian rationality is rationalism would say all truth from reason. A Christian rationalist would say all truth through reason. Even God can't, doesn't communicate truth any other way than that. That's the faculty he's given us by means of which we apprehend anything. And that, that remains intact in people. And the picture that we have in the Bible is that they learn about God from special revelation and natural revelation, but they don't want to keep God in their thinking. You know the classic statement in Romans 1, 
They would not have God in their thinking, but they already have God in their thinking. They wouldn't even know they didn't want to have God in their thinking unless they had him in their thinking. That's what's bothering him, the person. That they know God and they don't want to know God. They want to put him out of their conscience. It's all like swallowing something, you want to vomit up. It, but it's a part of you, and you don't like it. But you can't help it. The visible things declare the invisible God, and they know God because God himself has revealed it unto them. And knowing it, they know it through their, uh, through their mind, and that's the only thing. And they try then to suppress it, but they can't possibly actually not know it. And when you are enlightened in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, of course, it's the same thing. You know who Christ is? Who do men say that? Who do you say that I am? And so on. That comes through this. Now, it won't convert you until it reaches here, but it never reaches here except through here. And no shortcut possible yet. Yeah. Oh, not in the Word of God today, but in bad translations or mistranslations or bad transmissions or something like that, yes. That's, of course, the problem we all have. Uh, here are the, uh, let's take a look, uh, for example, at this. Here, this is an old, uh, this is an old um, Westcott and Hort text, Greek text with an English uh, King James uh, a version. Here. Even the text is constantly being improved. And, uh, I mean, our knowledge of the text becomes more complete, and we uh, recognize that one reading uh, is uh, inferior and should be supplanted by this. Now, they're all negligible things and so on, but we've got to watch the text itself. And then here's the King James uh, translation alongside of it. A great deal of room for improvement in that particular thing. This is the reason in seminary we insist on our students for the ministry studying the Greek and the Hebrew so that they can work with the original text so that when they do stand in the pulpit, they give you as uh, accurate a translation as you can possibly uh, get because there is room for error in that point. And then, of course, you've got to talk about, you've got to think about this, those of us who preach also. I can err as I uh, judge what the text is. I can err as I judge what the translation is. I can err as I judge what the application is. I have plenty of room for error and I've got to be on my guard all the time not to make any error because the souls of people I have to give, I'm responsible for. What I preach, what uh, Ray Graham, uh, what uh, Tom Graham and other people preach, uh, they have to answer to God for. But, uh, but the point about this, while I admit uh, sadly and gladly, as a matter of fact, I admit without any question, but I have to say it sadly because it is uh, unfortunate uh, there that uh, it is nevertheless not an in, uh, insuperable obstacle. It just means that we have to go very carefully. We have to work pretty hard. We've got to do our homework and so on. And I'm sure that we uh, uh, can understand basically, soundly, what the Bible is. If someone says, Maybe this is in the back of your mind, I don't know, but it's, uh, it's in the back of some people's mind when we get thinking in this particular area. If we have to admit that possible list of errors which you just mentioned, Mr. Gershner, what's the difference between inerrancy and, and the Scripture or not? Well, you see, the great difference is this. If we had a text to begin with, which uh, was either uninspired or partly inspired and we know not where, and so on, we wouldn't have a basic foundation on which to work. As it is, if we do have what we claim in this, an inerrant revelation from God. We have a science of, 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 uh, of um, textual criticism by, whereby we can get back ever more accurately to it, and so on. We have a science of exegesis, which we do very, very carefully. We can watch these mistakes. But the point is, you see, we have something sound on which to work and something sound to which to work. So let's say, going back to this illustration I gave you this morning with Stendhal. Stendhal, uh, as a New Testament scholar, can work on a passage and come to a conclusion, say essentially the same conclusion as I do about the Word, but it doesn't bind him at all. It's not the Word of God, you see. It's just the writing of Paul in this particular case, but this is what it says, you see. But if you have what is actually the Word of God and you know at that particular case, so take Bart once again. If you Bart work on a thing, and Bart, uh, people have often said when Bart was working on exegesis, mesama exegesis, tiresome, wearisome exegesis, he calls it in, a, in his commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism, his lectures on the Heidelberg Catechism. When a person is working on that type of thing, which he insisted he ought to do, and when Bart was working on it, and any number of people say, he, he sounds just like a fundamentalist. He treated the Bible with consummate respect, and so did his son, but his son was a professional New Testament exegete, whereas Karl Barth was a systematist, excuse the expression, he would never call himself a systematician, a dogmatician, and, uh, and so on. But the point is, he had Mark at Bart, uh, I remember Will Orr saying about him, that his knowledge was frightful about a certain part of it, a mass of material he had read, he waded through, and so on, uh, on that point. But suppose he does, he wades through it. He finds out what the best text of Colossians 1.16 is, what the best possible exegesis is, and so on. Then what do you have? The word of men. This is, uh, if I may put this a little aside in a little historical observation, it's been an interesting thing with me to observe 
the way they, <clears throat> I've seen this both in Switzerland and in America. And I studied uh, a little bit uh, under Bart at, uh, when he was lecturing for Brunner in uh, Zurich uh, years ago and so on. And uh, Zurich is, uh, was uh, Brunner's, of course, uh, university. And uh, when I was doing some studying there and talking with the students of Brunner, Brunner was in the same body and type of tradition. They had their differences, of course, but the same neo-Orthodox type of pattern. And uh, it was very interesting to get acquainted with some of the students of uh, Brunner. And uh, one of the things I noticed about them, and I noticed about this, the same over in this country, that while Brunner and Bart and uh, the leaders in this particular school were solid exegetes who really labored at the text and so on, the men who came after, the students of theirs, uh, weren't putting forth that kind of labor. For example, at, at our own seminary, we, we were inundated with neo-Orthodox uh, a while ago. We don't have so many at the present uh, moment. I never saw one of those men ever ascend the pulpit preach a lecture, and to preach a sermon, in which he had not seriously labored on the exegesis of the passage. I almost never agreed with his exegesis, but I always admired the effort he made and the manifest scholarly attempt that he put forth to find out what that portion of Scripture thought. But the students of theirs, who were more or less uh, uh, disciples of the same way of thought, they weren't doing it. And I could see what was happening here. These persons... Uh, coming by different routes and also being established scholars with national and sometimes international reputation and so on, were heavy scholars, but they were laboring to something, towards something, which when they found was the word of man. Well, you could see how the next generation, convinced of a thing like that and realizing the ultimate futility of the effort, were going to wonder why bother. And that was fundamentally what was happening. And I couldn't see any of the students in this particular tradition, who admired professors who did labor at this Mizama, Exegesa, and so on, who were putting forth that kind of labor themselves, either in, in Zurich among the students of Brunner or over in this country among the students of Bart and Brunner and, uh, and all. But at any rate, um, uh, let me get back to this. Uh, yeah, I think I better, uh, I, better, uh, I better take over here for a while because at 4.30 gets uh, along pretty fast uh, here. I want to get this point over uh, particularly, and we've got to face the question you've really given me for the afternoon, namely whether this is a divisive thing and whether it's something that ought to have been ignored and not ever have uh, led to the formation of uh, the IB ICBI or the writing of the Battle for the Bible or the publication of these books and other books that are coming and lectures that are being given all over the country and such things as, as that. I want to say something about that, but I would like to get this said before I, uh, before I do. So break in, but at the same time, I may make my comments very brief uh, because of the passage of the time. The, um, here again is an experience, but it's a significant experience, I think, so I'll relate it. Friedman was one of our professors at one time. He's now at the University of Michigan, and he's the uh, general editor of the Anchor Bible. He's one of the most brilliant men I've ever known, a converted Jew who has a computer for a brain. And so it's fascinating to listen to him talk. Um, no matter how abominable what he was saying might be in a given instance and so on. Absolutely fascinating to hear him, and frequently what he said was very edifying. But it didn't make any difference whether it was edifying or not, but the way the words rolled off his tongue, the way the mind worked and so on. He's a prodigious and very influential man in the Old Testament field, and in a certain mild way, conservative. Well, one time while he was still at Pittsburgh, he said after a, a meeting of full professors, he said, Jack, would you wait a little bit afterwards? I'd, I'd like to ask you some questions, which I'd like yes or no answers. And I said, yes, I go ahead. <laughs> and several of the other professors stayed to uh, listen in because they apparently knew the kind of questions he was going to ask me. Well, what he was asking me were questions on inerrancy. And the point that he was, uh, kind of try to, was trying to do was to break me down on inerrancy by cl uh, close questioning. And I played the game. That is, I kept my answers to yes and no as far as I possibly could. I poured over into a full sentence now and then. But for the most part, I stayed right with it for a half an hour while he grilled me in a very, it's a delightful way. I mean, it's absolutely fair, very, the kind of thing I love. I, that's exactly what I think we're supposed to do with one another. And I would, I'd, I'd appreciate it myself. If there's some fallacy in my reasoning uh, for it to be turned up. And so I don't want to go around telling people. It's one of the reasons I studied at liberal Harvard. I didn't want to be saying things like this to you in my 60s and so on that I had been exploded in my 20s and so on. I didn't want to go to a conservative place like Princeton. I went up to Harvard where we, you know, liberalism was so urbane that they had long ago buried the deity, a, a good decade before he was officially declared dead, and so on. Well, Friedman put me through the paces. And I can't, you'll, you'll have to ask Friedman for yourself on this kind of, whether he said uh, afterwards, 
Gerstner is the stupidest person I have ever met, or he is the stubbornest person I have ever met, or I have to admit, I couldn't break him down. Now, that was my own personal estimate. He didn't break me down legitimately. I wasn't being stupid, I don't think, and I wasn't being stubborn, I don't think. I think he didn't break me down. He showed problems. And I, as I say, I don't have time to go through that all. And then I said to David, after it was over, I said, uh, David, I stuck to your r- rules of the game. Yes and no answer. I had no time. But now, let me say this one thing. I believe there's a case for the inspiration of the Bible. And any time you want to stay for a half an hour meeting, half an hour after faculty, I'll be very glad to spell it out to you. But I believe there's an argument for the inspiration of the Bible. I don't even have time to spell it out for you here, but that demonstrates and proves it. And consequently, I put the whole burden of proof for errancy on you, because I think there's a sound case that indicates this is the Word of God and it therefore cannot err. And the reason I have made you that your pound of flesh without a drop of blood at any particular point in our whole discussion is precisely because of that particular point. If we had been talking about Shakespeare and you had mounted the kind of problems in Shakespeare, I would have very, in a number of places, gladly admitted that in all probability Shakespeare was inconsistent with himself. But I have no reason to believe Shakespeare is anything other than fallible. I can't draw up any brief for the inspiration of William Shakespeare. And this kind of difficulty that you would show in the writings of any human being very credible evidence that he made a mistake and so on. But in this particular instance, I fight you down to the last ground because of the fact that I think there's evidence that this is the word of God. And if you're going to show that it's errant, you have satisfied me. It is not the word of God at that point. God cannot err. And if you can show me that, it, that the Bible errs at any particular point where the text is indisputable, and where the interpretation is indisputable and so on, I will grant you this doctrine is wrong and I will abandon it here and now. And I won't go around claiming that the Bible is the word of God. That's how serious this is. But you do have the burden of the proof. You do have to show it and I don't think you ever showed it in your half an hour very fine uh, examination of, uh, of my scruples. I mention that to you because of the fact that uh, with respect to things like discrepancies and so on, uh, I personally believe, I agree completely with Bill Hussor and all the other exegetes and all the systemata- systematicians, as far as I know, agree with them. We ought to be very careful about these things. And if we don't know what the explanation uh, for the fact that uh, the cleansing of the temple in John comes early and in the synoptics late and so on, uh, why that is, well, we don't know why it is. But that it could be two cleansings of the temple... Whether one wasn't concerned about the chronological order, I don't know. But that we know why that happened. Or how did uh, Matthew 27, 9 insert the word Jeremiah when obviously it should have been Zechariah? I don't know what the explanation of that is. Only I'd say as Calvin does with respect to some things like that. And be sure of one thing. The error is not in the original. It couldn't be in the original. If you have any case for the inspiration of God. But that doesn't say there are half a dozen different explanations have been offered on uh, Jeremiah 27, 9. That doesn't say you necessarily have a satisfactory one. I, I personally, though I'm far more of a historian of dogma and systematician than I am exegete, though I work at exegesis somewhat uh, as well. And everybody, of course, who's a minister works with a text uh, more or less, but not as professionals and so on. I uh, feel that we should be very, very careful about this matter and come very, very cautiously to conclusions. But the main point is the burden of proof, if there is a case for inspiration, that's the one regret I have that I haven't really spelled out the case for you, but I think you probably know what I have in mind uh, here, uh, puts the burden of proof on uh, on others. Let me, uh, it's quarter after now, let me say a word about this, uh, this matter of whether I think this is a divisive uh, issue and would better be uh, left unraised. There have been people who are saying this. And one of the most eloquent uh, laments of the existence of the issue at all comes from an inerrantist named Pinnock. Clark Pinnock, who one of the most brilliant middle-aged uh, evangelical scholars we have in the country. Was I teasing a moment ago? I think he's slipping a little bit with respect to an inerrancy, but as far as I know to this day, he's still an inerrantist, but he in the Eternity magazine where they uh, solicited the opinions of a number of well-known evangelicals as to what they thought about the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy. 
and so on. Clark Pinnock gave the statement. He just wept at the matter and said, such a dreadfully unfortunate thing. We had so many important struggles to go on to uh, what he felt was basically a picayune issue. What, what these people should be doing would be going after Harvard and Yale, not after Fuller. Fuller is, after all, still an evangelical institution and so on. Why have a battle with fellow evangelicals in a day when secularism and all sorts of theological degeneration prevail almost universally. What a pitiable waste of energy, he felt. Now, my reply to that is this. I've never written or talked to Clark personally. I haven't seen him since that time. But, uh, but what I would say to him, if he, when I do see him, I'll, I'll bring this up because I'm really distressed by his remarks uh, on the matter. But what I would say to him is this. Clark, Harvard and Yale and the schools you're talking about like that, they are over the hill. They are so far gone. They are not in the slightest bit interested in listening to the possible feasibility of either infallibility or inerrancy. For example, I I can have a two-hour debate with Christopher Stendhal, but you can be perfectly sure it isn't all. He wouldn't even debate on the subject of inerrancy. The subject was... What's the role of the Bible in the life of a Christian? That's a respectable subject, but he would never have agreed. You know, that, that, that's absolutely out of the realm. Is, I quote Heinrich Ott once again. Nobody, have, according to him, has believed in uh, um, verbal... In, he either used inerrancy or verbal inspiration. I'm not quite sure. I think it was inerrancy. Nobody has believed in inerrancy for 200 years. I mean, that's the way Harvard and Yale and Basel and those schools believe. I say, par, I say Clark, nothing would please me more and to be able to have live communication with them. But for them, it's a dead issue. And dead a long time ago, and so on. Fuller is at the head of the slippery slope, in my opinion. You might be able to do something about Fuller. And not only Fuller. Now, all of, most of our conservative seminaries are having problems at this particular time, as you must realize. Fuller is probably the biggest, best known, in reform circles, which is having problems because... And it was centered on by, uh, by Linzel in his, uh, in his book. I would liken it to the situation we hear often described in terms of world catastrophe, where you have three different groups of people. One group of people are going to starve, and there's just nothing you can do about it. They're going to die. You're just going to have to write them off. There's another group which is well established, and there's a group in between, that if you get to them in time, you can save them. That's where Fuller is. Harvard and where I did my own doctoral work and Yale and those places, they are they're gone as far as this sort of thing is concerned. You say, can't go. Oh, yes, God can. We don't know what God is going to do. We have to act according to what he has done in providence so far. We have to um, make our efforts where we, where we are. And as I say, nothing would please me more than to have these schools open to this type of thing, but they, they have to be open to it, and they certainly are not at the present time. So in reference to the question, isn't this a, a division and so on, I say, it's not a creating of the division, it's a revealing of the division. This position exists. We didn't create it. We're just calling attention to it because it's serious and we want to try to have live dialogue with people whom we consider not only Christians, but conservative Christians. Not inerrantists, but they have a high view of the Bible. We don't think they can consistently maintain it. And they're going to suffer attrition, and they're already doing so. But at the meantime, now we consider them as people who are fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, they hold essentially conservative position and we would like very much to have a conversation with them. And they must think we are too extreme to the right. Well, that's fine. They ought to want to have the same kind of talk with us to see if they can't pull us into the center, see that we can't make us realize more what has gotten them where they are and so on. Have exactly a live debate. We don't expect them to lie down and play dead when we talk to them. We don't expect them to have no reasons for taking the position they do. We think we're a very articulate type of people, and they'll be ready with remarks, and they'll be able to comment. And so we want live, open debate, because in our opinion... The situation is very serious, and it's a division that if it's not noticed, as it would not be noticed otherwise, can be fatal without your actually even observing it. So in a sentence, we didn't create this division. It actually existed beforehand. We are calling attention to it because we think by this method something good can be done, first with respect to those whom we think are on the slippery slope, and secondly with respect to those who are not but who might be tempted to get uh, onto it. As a historian of dogma, one of the things I'd call to your attention in this case is that creeds have always come into existence that way. You never have creeds as long as... Here's a group of people, for example. Suppose we, we were, uh, belonged to the church. We were different groups and so on. But suppose we all belonged to the same church. And we all knew each other. We knew what we believed. We don't have any creed. It wouldn't be necessary. We know exactly 
what we believe. And then suddenly he and she and he and she and so on are beginning to say something that sounds different to the rest of us. And we listen, and it is different. And we listen a little longer, it's seriously different. And we have to have discussion about it. And uh, our fears are confirmed. It really is different. It's so different that uh, it's going to call for a, um, a real outside on that song, a real battle, a real uh, struggle. And the majority of us are going to say, we're going to have to spell out this is what we believe. Uh, this is the basis of our fellowship in peace and withdrawal from our particular community. That's, a, that's the way creeds come about. The early church, modern church, any other time, and the Presbyterian church, very good. We adopted the Westminster Confession in 1729. You know, that's a long time after we got started, you know, a couple decades and so on. Why? Because everybody understood, they thought, that everybody agreed in Presbyterianism. But there's some questions growing up there about the Calvinism and so on. So they said, we'll adopt the Westminster Confession and we'll require that to be subscribed by our adherents and so on. That's the way it is. Now, normally, a group of persons like ourselves in Fuller Seminary, which is established as this kind of seminary and so on, would be in perfect harmony with each other. We find some difference. We find the uh, opinion of some of us, the difference is uh, serious. So we say, before we part company, let's talk together, and let's see if we can't, instead of separating, close ranks. Let's find out whether, for example, the difference is negotiable, or it's the kind of thing that can be born with in the same perfect, because it's still, uh, even though it's slightly different and so on, it still, without dispute and without danger, maintains the glory of divine inspiration and so on. And that though Fuller says it, shibboleth, and uh, Westminster says it, shibboleth, and so on, it's only that kind of difference, and it should not cause trouble among brothers and sisters and so on. Or no, indeed, they're on the same slope that leads to, that has led Harvard and Yale to that particular path, and we can't go that way, and we're going to have to warn our people if they don't turn, they're going to find themselves. That, that's what I would say uh, with reference to this matter of division. It is, uh, we didn't create the division. The division is there, and I think we're doing the best possible thing, calling attention to it, not by way of excoriation and rejection, but an invitation to honest, open, and brotherly Christian debate in the hope that we can help one another and close ranks together. And if we can't, and if in the conversation and the dialogue that follows, we find there's a serious and, uh, and irremediable breach between us, then the sooner we recognize that and go our separate ways, the better it will be. I think I saved you five minutes uh, for, uh, for uh, yes, sir. They write the more books, but it's, it's, it's grassroots, too. Mm-hmm. That often is the case, yeah. That was fr- Just on one front. You're perfectly right. That's often the case. And there are some, there's some of you who can deal with boards and so on, or on boards and all. That, uh, I'm glad to have you mention that. I know that was very true with respect to Fuller, for example. I know board members had a very great deal to do with it. You know that the formation of Westminster Seminary at Princeton came by a reorganization of the board. And I know in Pittsburgh Seminary, the board has a tremendous uh, amount to do with these things. I'm glad you brought out that aspect. That's just like an ivory tower professor, not to think of a practical factor like that, but it's a very, very formidable one. Any other questions or comments? <laughs> yeah, we only got five minutes. Okay. The thing that bothers me, it's bothered me, I guess, throughout my Christian life. You mentioned some of these men massive in their intellects, massive in learning, studying the scriptures, digging it out, and then coming out wrong. Now, does, it, does the 1 Corinthians 2.14 passage apply to this, the natural man receiveth not the things of God, but the spiritual return to the divine? I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's that passage. See, that would be working on the assumption they were not regenerate people, and I think they, uh, every evidence is that they are regenerate people. I think the explanation would be that all of us who are regenerate have remaining corruption, as the Reformed view teaches. And we are capable, therefore, of error. And um, we may be in error, they may be in error, but the possibility of either one of us or both of us being in error is certainly compatible with Reformed doctrine. Now, we think in this particular case that though we are far, uh, we're far from free from fault, we think our position on this is the sounder of the two positions, and they think, uh, we think that these brothers and sisters in Christ have taken a position which is uh, an erring position, and that we believe that because they are Christians, and if it can be pointed out, because they love truth, 
And we really do think we are advocating the truth, and they are on a path of error in this matter, because they are lovers of truth. They will, indeed, be able to see that. And if, on the other hand, it is we who are in error, and they, and we're listening just as openly to them as we hope they will listen to us, then if our hearts are right with Christ, when they point out that this is too tight a position, that you're saying something you can't prove, or you're alienating brethren by making a stricter demand than is legitimate or something like that, and they can convince us that that is the case, then it would prove that we are in error and that if our heart is light, right with Christ, we will certainly thank our brothers and close ranks by amending our ways. But in a sentence, uh, I don't know why you're particularly troubled by it. Uh, you could be grieved by it, but I mean intellectually troubled by it, as long as you accept the proposition of the doctrine of imperfection of the saints. Yeah, Bullman, well, you're, you're in a different category when you talk about Bullman. Yeah, well, Bruner's a sort of borderline. You take a man like Bullman, who's absolutely in left field, and no evidence whatever of his ever believing anything truly evangelical. Take a man like Bullman. Well, what about him? Now, he gives a sound exegesis of 1 Corinthians 15. Let's suppose he, he must have been regener- unregenerate. There's no evidence whatever of new life in Christ there. But in Bart and Bruner, it's different. And, of course, with the uh, Fuller people, they're evangelicals. Well, the, uh, uh, in a couple minutes, uh, that, of course, is a more serious question, uh, um, Norman. But uh, for a, a, a brief thumbnail comment on that, um, I don't know how to do it in a thumbnail, that's the trouble with the... Uh, uh, we don't begin with the presupposition that the Bible is the Word of God. We don't just simply say it's the Word of God. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a brief outline of what I think is the proper apologetic uh, for it. I mean, it'll just have to be a brief uh, outline. uh, I'd start with the gospel records are essentially sound, essentially sound historical documents. Now, you see that none of of these statements, no matter how simplistic they may sound to you, that wouldn't wouldn't require debate with a number of uh, scholars at the present time. Some scholars are so far out that they're not sure we have anything. That's an authentic record of Jesus Christ. That's That's how far gone some of the situations are. And you just have to deal with a person according to where he is. But I would say this can be established. Most people would accept it pretty axiomatically. Others, on the other hand, you could spend weeks and weeks debating every, every single iota of it. But let's suppose God, the gospel records are essentially sound historical uh, documents. They reveal a Jesus Christ who, to keep the story simple, did miracles and was a kind of miracle. And... Uh, walked on water, raised the dead, and was raised from the dead, and so on, according to the uh, records and the persons who were there. Now, let's, uh, let's suppose that that is the case. If that is so, then this, then this Christ was sent by God because, as Nicodemus said, no one can do these miracles you do except God be with him. If someone says to make a statement like that, you have to establish a natural theology. I'll say, yeah, give me a week, I'll do it, and so on. Natural theology is true. The only reason, the only way you can say is what manner of this, what manner of man is this that he says to the state, waves be still, and they are, and so on, is that you recognize the only one who could have the power to walk on water or to raise the dead or to still the waves or something like that would have to be God. And you're working on the assumption now that you've established there is a God, and that this God is, of course, the creator of the world. And if a person has the power which could only come from the creator of the world, as the records indicate that this Jesus did, then he was sent by God. And he, now, since he says many things, but whatever he says must be true because he's sent from God. If God certified that you were sent from him, whatever you said, Norman, I would accept instantly because you would be a demonstrated vehicle of God and there couldn't be any possibility of God erring. And if he has made it perfectly clear to me that he was speaking through you, I wouldn't even debate with you. I'd only ask to explain it a little clearer or something like that. I would have no argument because I'm not going to argue with God and you'd be a, an authenticated messenger of God. Now, as far as the Scriptures are concerned, Christ teaches inerrancy. Now, here again, I don't know how hard that... That wouldn't be as hard to prove as you might think. There are a great many people, a great many radical school uh, scholars who believe that Jesus Christ taught inerrancy. Bultmann, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he did. I don't remember offhand whether his New Testament theology or did. He wouldn't believe it. Bultmann wouldn't. They could quite well believe that Jesus did. 
uh, believe in inerrancy. Ulicker said, with respect to the Bible, Jesus war ein fundamentalist. Jesus was a fundamentalist. Ulicker wasn't a fundamentalist. Ulicker didn't believe this. But if you want to get Jesus, and if you're satisfied that Jesus is sent by God, and as a matter of fact reveals himself to be God, and so on, and then it is true. Jesus said he, uh, that the word of God is infallible, that it is inerrant, and so on. You better believe it, you see. Now, that's what I would say is a, a sound reason for believing inerrancy. I don't just say believe in inerrancy, and I'm perfectly willing to spend the days, the weeks, and the years that are necessary to deal with any one of these problems, and I'm sensitive to the problems that would be raised. I don't expect anybody to lie down and play dead, as I say. I expect them to fight every inch of the ground where they think there's something that's uh, dubious here, but uh, our time, I guess, is up. But at any rate, uh, I'm glad you raised the question. I'm glad I got that much said before, uh, before we closed uh, shop uh, this afternoon. Sorry if it uh, was a little rapid for a subject as major as this, but I'm glad it's said rapidly than not said at all, at any rate. Do you want to close with prayer? Or what you, it's up to you. I'm, I'm glad, Terry, after a while, if any of you want to talk afterwards, I'll be very happy to talk with you. Nate, I don't know what people's schedules are. Would you like to close with prayer and then say, we'll say 15 minutes to okay. answer questions? Right. Those yeah, that's understood. After prayer, you feel free to go. And if anybody wants to stay and ask some questions, we'll do that if you will. Shall we close? Our Heavenly Father, Thou who dost hide in clouds of glory, which no man could penetrate if it was thy pleasure to remain hidden, who by searching could find out God. But Thou hast been pleased rather to make Thyself known. As thy servant John Calvin once said, Thou didst talk baby talk in order to be able to be understood by Thy servants. We thank Thee that Thou hast indeed moved holy men of old by Thy Spirit to convey Thy Word infallibly and inerrantly to us so that when we ponder and meditate the things of Holy Scripture, we are endeavoring to ascertain nothing less than the living Word of God. We pray that we may believe what Thou dost teach and obey, what Thou dost command, and then in the struggle in which we are involved in our day, that we may think very earnestly about these issues. We know that Thou art the Director of Providence and the Guider of the history of Thy Church and that nothing comes to pass without Thy divine and beneficent purpose in it and that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. And so we pray that we may get all the benefit that Thou dost design in this whole struggle and that it may result in a quickening of every branch of the Church and that brothers and sisters who are now drawing apart on a very vital matter, may find themselves drawn closer together as a result of our dialogue in these days of the past and the days before us. Dismiss us now with thy blessing, we pray thee, and help us uh, in answer to the Lord's Prayer to be sanctified by thy truth and thy word is truth. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, uh, blessings on those of you who have to leave. Anybody wants to raise a question? Anything's the order of the day. Yes, please. I guess along with his, he talked about oh, these men who um, search so diligently to prove, in a sense, that the Bible is not infallible. In other words, that it's uh, inerrant. When the Scripture says that when you are in Christ, Spirit will lead you to all truth. And yet these men who you say you believe are regenerate, okay, seem to be fighting desperately to just prove the opposite of what the Spirit would lead them into. And that confuses me. Well, I would say two things on that. Uh, one is that uh, while the promise of Christ is the Spirit will lead you into all truth, uh, it doesn't mean instantaneously. It may mean a terrific battle that goes on. And just because a person fights, suppose, let's suppose for the sake of argument, that inerrancy is true. Now, that's, uh, when you're dealing with somebody else, he's not, we're not going to assume that at the outset. That's the subject that's debated and all. But let's just, for the, because of the passage you raise and so on, let's just assume for the sake of argument that our, sight, uh, uh, that our position is right and that this person is therefore in error in opposing it, which we said is quite compatible with his being genuinely regenerate. Now, the, the Holy Spirit uh, could be working with him to lead us to our, lead him to our position, which we're assuming is right now. But you can see how it, it could be a, a tremendous thing. This man may have taken in with his mother's milk the idea that the Bible's not inspired uh, absolutely in every detail. Roman Catholics have a beautiful expression, you know, invincible ignorance. And they're not referring to intelligence. They're talking about psychological conditioning. 
A person can get conditioned very, very heavily in a certain direction. And uh, that's what I say where I have a great deal of sympathy for people like Karl Barth. They came from a thoroughgoing liberal background, and they virtually had to fight every inch of the way back up the hill again to something that you may have been born to, you see, as a, as a part of the uh, heritage you enjoyed. And the spirit, you see, may be working. If I may use a, f- a figure of, uh, of uh, C.S. Lewis's again, he has a delightful expression. I think it's in his great divorce or something. I don't forget, remember where it is. Did you ever hear about Dick Firkin and uh, Annie Bates? And Dick Firkin was one of these people to whom the uh, world was his oyster and he's born to, to the manor born and everything, just charming, had all sorts of charisma. Everybody liked Dick Firkin. He was unregenerate, but very charming, and everybody liked Dick Firkin. Now, Annie Bates was a weasened old lady who was converted, really converted, and she had the love of God in her soul, but she had had many, many decades of very bitter uh, psychological conditioning. And even after, I forget the way Lewis puts it, say even after 10 years, she would be a much less attractive person than Dick Perkin was all his life. And yet she was really regenerate. And and Perkin wasn't. And as he was saying, and I was saying earlier there, you you estimate a product by that from which it was made. Look at the immense advance that's made in that particular woman. She really has the love of God in her. But look what she's overcoming. Look what she's fighting. Well, intellectually, it can be the same way. People can be, you take a man like Heinrich Gott, if he can make a statement like that, nobody has believed in, uh, in inerrancy for 200 years. Just think. He sees somebody, I, uh, we've got a student, well, Jim Boyce is a graduate, but I don't, he never worked under Ott, he's working on, working on other people. Well, I've got an inerrancy man over there right now who's working under Bo Rika. Bo Rika wouldn't say anything as drastic as that, but suppose he were working under Heinrich Gott. First thing you get is, here's a guy living today in his right mind, good academic credentials and a brain. And he believes in inerrancy. See, that would be a state of trauma in which he'd be. But after a while, he'd get used to it. And he'd get it. Why, the guy's able to deal with criticism. He sits loose on a number of things that I, according to my picture, conservatives never do, and so on. But look at all the obstacles that have. That man might be reached, ultimately. But think of the thing he'd have to go through. Now, the spirit, you see, is making terrific progress in his heart. But it wouldn't, wouldn't look that way in comparison with uh, because of the distance from which he has... Uh, has come. It's interesting, a couple times now this afternoon, that question of the, the inner experience of persons uh, has been brought up. It's relevant, of course. Anything else you want? Bring up? Yes, sir? You uh, state that uh, they call it tradition and I'm full of theology. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's the general's good position, by the way. We've been mentioning Fuller only because Lenzel oriented, but most of the conservative uh, seminars today are having the same problem. So go ahead, please. Oh, I think they would uh, wouldn't have much trouble with the first uh, with the first one. They would have a massive trouble with miracles. Not so much that they might uh, not uh, admit them, but uh, they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't feel you could prove them. And uh, you apologize for miracles these days rather than with miracles. You're you're looked on as rather naive if you believe in miracles and if you use them as a basis of apologetics. Now, classically and historically, miracles have been the basic apologetic of Christianity from the days of the apostles right on through. I mean, you consider fulfilled prophecy, you understand, and things like that, and the unity of Scripture. They're all the argument for miracle and all. But uh, that, would be, uh, that would be a place you'd have to do some hard work. Uh, Paul Jewett, for example, is a theologian out there. There was a time when he would have stood for that, but he's been uh, profoundly influenced. He wrote a book on Bruner's uh, Doctrine of Revelation oh, a good 30 or so years ago, in which he made the kind of critique of Brunner that I would make today. But he, he rejects it now. He rejects his own position there. And if he'd have to, if that's the case, then obviously he wouldn't proceed this way any longer. I know Paul Jewett casually. I've never had a discussion on this particular point. But that would be a place where you would, uh, would have. The ringing the changes on rationality would go on throughout this. It's a rational argument. You know, that's a bad word. You wash your mouth out when you use the word rational. You're not supposed to be rational. You're supposed to be spiritual. So you'd have that particular obstacle to overcome. And I'd have to give the kind of lecture I made a moment ago there about the fact that there is no such thing as feeling something about which you don't have an idea. And the ideas come only through this particular uh, vehicle. It makes no difference. But nevertheless, you're asking about what the problems would be. They'd give you problems. They don't want to prove. And, uh, the, um, and Christ teaches inerrancy. Uh, certainly Everett Harrison, who's retired out there now, would certainly believe that. I, I don't know how the other 
New Testament uh, people be, uh, would be. I think they would be inclined to that uh, uh, position. He might uh, might argue, for example, in Christ's comments on Moses' law and changes the law of divorce that uh, he's not exactly approving everything in the Old Testament, you know, something like that. But um, the main objection that they would give and the main... If I were dealing with, uh, say, Jack Rogers, a former student of mine, an excellent person, a fine mind, a kind of person with whom you can talk uh, very uh, well, a Burkauer disciple, a uh, thorough, uh, uh, he really feels that Burkauer has led him into the promised land as far as the uh, uh, theological insights are concerned. Still a very dear friend of mine and a very choice person and a top-rate uh, scholar and, uh, and uh, thinker on the slide, in my opinion, about halfway down to the, to the uh, bottom. But he's the kind of person I could talk with and uh, he'd know full well I'm think- that I think he'd be delighted to hear. I think he's only halfway down, as a matter of fact. <laughs> but he could talk. Uh, he could talk with me, take it very seriously, and so on. But Burkhauer has meant a great deal to him, precisely because Burkhauer has shown him another way by which you can avoid this type of thing. Now, this is a sweaty job, you know. You really have to, you have to fight every inch of the way in this type of thing. And that's the reason most all of modern apologetics uh, tend to be presuppositional or fideistic. And uh, you you uh, you argue for miracles from Christ rather than Christ from miracles. The last century, you see, it was Schleiermacher who started that type of thing. He couldn't believe in miracles except for the fact that Christ was reported to have done them. And he takes Christ at the outset. See, in Schleiermacher, we think of as the father of liberalism. <coughs> that was the way, but it's a, it's the traditional approach for evangelicals today. There's a massive fideistic uh, strain in a modern thought. So again, uh, to make my remarks brief, I'd, I'd summarize it in that one sentence. But if I were dealing with, uh, say, Jack Rogers, just to be particular, as, as the editor of this book and a dear personal friend of mine I know very well and, uh, and uh, respect highly and so on, uh, these are the kinds of problems he would have. He, he would uh, be sympathetic with this. He, he'd, he'd wonder whether I can establish it beyond dispute, you know, and that type of thing. And uh, this, this would give him real trouble. I don't think he's rejecting miracles, but I don't think he would want the, the case for Christianity and the Bible to rest uh, on it. I'm not sure whether he's still hanging in there with it, but uh, I'm sure he wouldn't want that, uh, that role, and consequently he wouldn't want this type of pattern. I don't think he could accept this easily, I mean, but he would listen, and if I had a case, he would, he would listen to it very fairly, and I would kind of consider it a real possibility that uh, if I was sound as I think I am on this matter, and he's as bright as I think he is, and as candid, I think I could uh, reach him on that type of thing, though I don't know. I've had a chance once. He sat in a number of my classes, and, uh, and uh, he found his consolation in, uh, in Burkauer, not in Gerstner or Lucci, the one. He, if you ever read his book on the Confessions of a Conservative Evangelical, it's a very poignant tale. His knees, he says, were callous from praying in his rather fundamentalist home when he was growing up. And then when he came to Pittsburgh Zenith Seminary, he was fortified in those uh, beliefs, but he was apparently having problems all the time as, uh, as well. He was much closer to Ad Leach than he was to me, but uh, still he was a good friend of mine. And uh, Burkauer seemed to find a happy medium for him, to give a happy medium for him. Uh, this, uh, he was getting uncomfortable. He did want to preserve evangelical Christianity, he considered himself evangelical. And uh, Burkauer has abandoned any kind of argument like this a long time ago in his... Uh, various and sundry writings in his uh, systematic theology as they've gone out. But that's a pretty unsatisfactory answer because I'm dealing with a number of different persons. But that's the way I think it would go with Jack Rogers. It would be a very fruitful discussion. Our main problem would be to find the time. But, of course, we're communicating by books and so on. Anything else? How did the how did the how a lay person deal with another lay person? With Carl Barn and all these other people that some I know and some I don't, and then in the seminary, well, how do I deal with it as my neighbor? Yeah, I see. Well, I think you see. Um, I think it's a sound. This is a sound approach, and I think you should use it with your neighbor. I would use it with your neighbor if I had an opportunity. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't talk seminary ease either. You know, I would talk plain English. With it. I wouldn't assume she knew Bultmann or Bart from the kitchen sink or anything like that. We just start at the beginning. And she knows about the Gospels. And I talk to her about it. I talk her language and so on. Now, you, that's exactly what you would do. They really, there's, um, there's no uh, basic difference uh, between us on that. And, though, and I've, many a time I've found in my, I'm sure you have as a pastor, and I'm sure you have as a pastor, 
I know that Bob Latham is not here now, that pastor. We meet any number of lay people who are far better theologians than some students we have. They don't have the vocabulary, and they can't move with the, uh, with the uh, same speed because of the lack of vocabulary and orientation. But frequently, they have very fine, superior minds. Just the fact that a person is a, a layman doesn't mean he doesn't have a good theological mind. It means he probably hadn't had a, a trained theological mind. But uh, I would say definitely, just speak her language, that's all. And if I failed, see, if, uh, I might have to apologize to you. Maybe I went around this too fast because I was speaking at least semi-academically here to a pretty heavily academic uh, group, and maybe I wasn't as careful as I should have been. I hope you'll forgive me for that, but uh, I could have, if I had known this was all lay, uh, lay group, for example, I would have gone uh, in such a way that I think they could have uh, communicated. And I think you should know it. That's what I'm trying to say. And in your own way, uh, say it, uh, too. As a matter of fact, you see, I think you ought to be able to talk to a to a straying seminary professor. See, that, that, that type of case. I mean, cogently. They'd be very inclined to look down, uh, uh, that type of thing, but we, we can be sensible at times, too, you know, and, uh, and say that, you know, that she's not tra- a seminary trained person and all the rest of it. But uh, that's a point I hadn't thought of. She's got a point here and a point there, you know. And after all, we're not supposed to be proud, and we are certainly, certainly aren't supposed to assume that just because we've had certain credentials that we therefore know more than somebody who hasn't had the same credentials. We ought to know better than that. Did I see a hand here? I'm going to ask a question. How can you accept the first supposition of pointer without accepting the second? I think, there, I think you're right in the sense that, that this narrative clearly represents Jesus as a miracle worker. The person that you'd have problems with. Let me give you an example of it. When I was doing my doctoral work at Harvard back in the 40s, Robert Pfeiffer was teaching in the Old Testament. And um, some student in the class uh, at one point asked him this question, Dr. Pfeiffer, uh, when you come to a miracle in the Old Testament, what do you do with it? We knew he was a, 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 ra- a naturalist who didn't believe in miracles. So this student had asked this question, uh, what do you do when you come to a miracle? And Dr. Pfeiffer says, well, I skip over it and go to the next historical section. You see what I mean? There's some people who think miracles don't happen. And so he will admit, most anybody who knows the narrative here will admit that miracles are reported to have happened. Now, this person thinks miracles don't happen, so in the liberalism of the 19th century, they would account for Jesus' walking on water. It was in the morning when it was still foggy, and some people from the shore looked out there, and Jesus was walking along the shore, and it looked every bit as if he were walking on the water, you see. He didn't really walk on the water. Lloyd Douglas says the feeding of the 5,000. This is the way it took place. Jesus started with a little boy and his lunch, and then another boy around there said, he ought to share his lunch, and the girl next to him started to share. The first thing you know, all these people were sharing their lunches, and everybody had something to eat. You see what I mean? What they would try to say is, when they read this sort of thing, miracles don't really happen. It's truly in the narrative. Let's try to explain them. Now, there's hardly anybody today. That, that kind of liberalism has practically been defunct since uh, Albert Schweitzer wrote his book in the quest for the uh, historical Jesus, because Albert Schweitzer was himself one of these persons. He wouldn't believe in miracles, but he certainly believed that Jesus did. And he believed that Christ was coming again in clouds of glory and so on. And that's what shook everybody up, you see, because a man like, uh, like Albert Schweitzer was saying a thing like that. Yes, I was saying to somebody in the intermission here that when Hans King writes a book on the infallibility, he's writing something which Philip Schaff had written far better a hundred centru- years before, but it stops the clock because this isn't a Protestant writing on the Roman doctrine of uh, uh, infallibility in the way in which Protestants usually do. This was a Jesuit Roman Catholic scholar doing it. That stops traffic, you see, and so on. So Albert Schweitzer stopped traffic because of the fact that he was saying, uh, just as Cadbury, under whom I study, was saying a little bit later at this particular time, the historical Jesus was no 20th century reformer. You've got to recognize him for what he was. He was expecting to come again in clouds of glory and such things as that. Great as that. When you look at Mark, which is supposed to be the primitive gospel and so on, and and, in contrast with John, which has these grandiose pictures of the uh, Christology of Christ, he says Mark's as bad as John, meaning by that that Mark has these things too. In other words, they recognize that miracle is there. And what do you do when you're not there? Uh, you, you try to deny it. Well, most everybody has given that up. So what we're doing in our day, and Bultmann has been the major exponent of it, is demythologize this process and say, of course that didn't happen. Nobody who has copper plumbing and two cars in his garage thinks for a moment that people walk on water or anything like that. But it has an existential meaning. And the phenomenon at Heidelberg that happened was a Jewish philosopher 
actually laid an atheistic existentialist doctrine which a so-called Christian theologian named Rudolf Bultmann took and made the basis for his theology uh, centering on the resurrection of Christ. Now, that's a long-winded way of saying, uh, in answer to your question, what objection would they have to that? I say, as far as the documents are concerned, none. You simply can't read these records without knowing that Jesus is supposed to have been a miracle worker. The liberals tried like mad to see if they couldn't uh, re- reinterpret them. They've given up the ghost on that ever since the beginning of this century. It has been attempted again in a somewhat different and much more subtle and sophisticated guide by, by Bultmann. So, to put it in a sentence, they would admit that this is what the document said, that swallow hard to live with a proposition that could have happened, you see. But uh, then you say to them, why couldn't it have happened? And if it did happen, yes, you say, you don't have a problem with that. But I know some people, they go in a traumatic state. They don't come out for days, you see, when they say, say a thing like that. It's an interesting thing. You see, you, 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 uh, you're natural to this, but you, you don't know some of the people I live with. You say a thing like that very slowly, and you fill them with sedatives before they do. So they, huh? Uh-huh. Well, I just told you the way in which they do, but I don't think there is any satisfactory answer to the question. And then if there is a God, see, these people would uh, here uh, would question whether there's a God. This is what led to the death of God theology. Mahanian, uh, for example, lectured once, and he said about Karl Barth. Karl Barth would like to start his theology with Jesus Christ, and he says, uh, Jesus Christ said, Thou art the Christ, I mean, uh, Jesus, Paul said that, Peter said to uh, Jesus, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Said Vahanian, do you notice that? Christ himself is defined in terms of God. You don't define God in terms of Christ. You define uh, Christ in terms of God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So they knew there was a God. You believe in God, said Jesus. Believe also in me. But there are people who would have trouble with this. So you'd have to go according to their status and prove to them, if that was necessary, there is a God. And if there is a God, He's the creator of all things. And he is the only one who can still wave. He's the only one who can raise the dead. He's the only one who can walk on water. He's the only one who can multiply loaves and fishes and so on. But that's what I meant by saying you just have to deal with the person where he is. And you have to go at the pace he or she wants to go. And you have to pray, of course, all the time that the Lord will be pleased to use your work savingly, which he may or may not. But he will use it as he pleases. But I guess my time is uh, up and any other conversation will have to be private. Okay. What's that, buddy? What time are you speaking tonight? 7.30, the boss says. When he says stand up, I stand up. When he says sit down, I sit down. It's 7-